In this tutorial, we're going to start diving into the mathematics of how plane waves behave when there's an interface. I've held on to here some stuff from the last tutorial where we had an incident plane wave and a refracted wa plane wave as well as an arrow for a reflected one. And this gave rise to some language for the electric field plane wave that we could write just for describing a plane wave traveling in a material with a refractive index N1 and a plane wave traveling in, refra in a material with refra refractive index N2. Now, we want to write an expression for the total electric field that could exist in this problem, both to the left and right of the interface. And so we're going to introduce some new language here. We're going to say that the electric field anywhere, so I'm going to explicitly say this is a function of position and time, and we want to say that that electric field is written in this sort of way. It's equal to E1, where I won't write R and T here. It's equal to E1 for, R, for X less than 0. And it's equal to E2, the E2 expression, for X greater than 0. And we could even say less than or equal to zero, greater than or equal to zero. They have to sort of match up. So this is an expression that makes sense, I think, in writing. In order to write it mathematically so that we can actually take the divergence of the total electric field, there's going to be some abrupt change that happens right at x equals zero, and we're going to have to take derivatives. And when there's an abrupt change, that's something that's going to have a very special sort of infinite derivative. So we need a mathematical expression to get us through this. And there is such one and it's called the step function. So we're going to define this thing, capital theta, that's the step function, and theta of x is defined to be 0 for x less than 0, and 1 for x greater than 0. And we again don't really have to sweat exactly what it means at x equals zero, you could let it be a half if you really want to think about a specific number to associate there. So this then allows us to write the electric field as the following expression. The expression is now going to be E1 times this step function. And if I make the argument of the step function minus x, that means the step function equals one for x less than zero and zero for x greater than zero. So this flips around the step function. And then added to that is e2 times step function of positive x. So now when x is a positive number, the step function will be one, and when x is a negative number, the step function will be zero. And I'll write another closed brace there just to let you know this is a well-defined mathematical expression now where we can take the divergence of this total electric field and see what it's equal to. Let's get another piece of math squared away. If we're going to take the divergence of this expression, so one thing we'll have to do mathematically is calculate the gradient of this step function. So let's just get that out of the way. So the gradient of a step function by the definition of the gradient operation is going to be x hat times the x derivative of the step function and the same things for y and z. Well, now that we see it all, since the step function only depends upon x, it's a function that just looks like this if we were to graph it. When the argument of the step function equals zero, you transition from zero to one. It obviously has no y or z dependence, so clearly these two terms here go to zero. There is no dependence on y or z. And the derivative of the step function, its derivative is zero here, and its derivative is zero here. Right here, it has an infinite derivative. And we have a name for that infinite derivative in one dimension. We call it the delta function. And so what we're dealing with here 
is x hat times the delta function. The delta function is a quantity that if you integrate over a range that includes the delta function, you get 1. And if you integrate over a range that doesn't include the delta function, you get 0. So now we have the mathematics established here. We know how to write the electric field in this entire region as a sum of two well-defined single region plane waves that are simply only existing on the left hand side or the right hand side of this interface. Before we move on to actually evaluate the divergence of this electric field and learn something interesting about how the fields stitch together at the boundary, let's just make sure we can understand physically what this combined electric field means in terms of polarization. So I'm going to clear some stuff away now. So to think conceptually about what's happening at this interface, I'll draw a dashed line again to define that interface. And remember that as the incident plane wave is coming in, like that, suppose the electric field from this plane wave is within the plane of the page. So it's an oscillation like this. So that's the electric field oscillation direction for the incident wave. So we can consider a point very near the boundary. I'll draw it a little ways off for clarity. And we can say at that location, we can try to draw, that might be the particular strength of the electric field. And we can resolve that into components. We can think about the vertical component, the y component, y component of its electric field, and the x component. And what's interesting about E1's x component, which I've labeled here, is that it's actually, as it oscillates back and forth in time, it's truly pushing charge towards this boundary and away from this boundary. So you really are building up amounts of charge and then taking them away, building them up and taking them away. The y component, notice, is doing nothing of the sort. It's only moving charge parallel to the interface. So in terms of what's happening at this interface, it's the x component of the field that's building up charge over time. And when I say it's building up charge, I can think about polarizing the material. Remember, this material has some susceptibility, chi 1. And so there's going to be a certain strength of dipole built up here. If you want to think about a material, it's got, at some moment in time, it's gotten a certain amount of positive charge over at this end. It's got negative charge over at this end. This negative charge is being canceled out by a neighbor and another neighbor off to infinity. But over here, we've got unbalanced positive charge. We really have a surface charge density building up on this side. Now, on the other side of the interface, we can consider a point equally close. So these two points are really very close to the interface. Now, this, as you saw up here, this wave vector will be traveling in some different direction. And if it's polarized in the plane of the page, its electric field vector makes a different angle with the interface. So if we talk about trying to guess what electric field strength it's going to have, it's not going to be parallel to this electric field. If we resolve it, the important thing to see is that its x component, E2x, and its susceptibility, chi2, are different. So it's not necessarily going to be the case that the dipoles induced on this side, in terms of charge moving towards and away from the interface, are going to be the same as they were on the left-hand side. So I could draw, to el illustrate that, the sort of dipole set up here, but maybe it's not as strongly polarized. So in that case, we might have, instead of drawing four pluses, I'll only draw two pluses there and two minuses here. So the four pluses from the left are greater than the two minuses from the right. That's the physical thing for you to picture about why interesting things are happening at the boundary. As time moves forward and the electric field oscillates, we really do build up regions of net positive or negative charge at a location of the boundary as these dipoles polarize back and forth. One may be stronger on one side than the other. These neighbors that are identical cancel each other out everywhere in the volume of each individual piece of glass or any dielectric, 
But if you have two pieces of different glasses, or if you have air on one side and glass on the other side, you're going to have unbalanced electric charge building up, and that is going to create interesting physics in the next tutorial when we actually take the divergence of the electric field. Because remember that the divergence of the electric field everywhere is equal to the charge density everywhere. So apparently at the interface where we are building up unbalanced surface charges, we are going to have a charge density evaluating this expression del dot E with this, for this electric field E is the subject of our next tutorial.